Not sure if this is uh, streaming out there, but I'm trying to speak loudly enough so that everybody can hear. And uh, well, welcome. Welcome to Springbrook again. Um, my name's Thomas, for those who have any visitors. Last, this is the last sermon that I'm speaking on uh, of the series on the patriarchs that we've been talking about. Patriarchs are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Last week, though, we discussed how Isaac isn't really all that um, prominent in the, in the stories that are, that are kind of about him. And it's actually Jacob, or uh, yeah, son Jacob, and then his wife Rebecca that, that takes center stage in those. That was very interesting last week, I thought. Um, this week, I want us to talk about working. All right. This week, uh, we're going to talk about the last major section in Genesis, which really focuses on just two characters, Joseph uh, and Judah. And it's going to wrap up the legacy of Jacob, the last, last patriarch, um, who's also called Israel. Today, I want us to think about these characters in context, and I want us to break away from our own context. So we're going to spend a little bit of time thinking about that. What, what's our culture like, and how do we think about things, and how can we step away from that more and step into the Bible? Uh, we're also going to think about Genesis as, as being Torah or instruction. But first, we're going to start with this guy, Joseph, and his, his uh, story. Derek, I'm going to need you to, to page through. So uh, turn with me to Genesis chapter 41. Because for, for Joseph's story, it's, it's going to start way back um, uh, or earlier than this. Uh, or sorry, Joseph's story uh, starts before Genesis 41. Uh, when his, when his, you find out about this character, he's uh, very young and kind of arrogant. Uh, he gets into trouble with his brothers, and they sell him into slavery down in Egypt. Then uh, you might have heard about the story with him and Potiphar, and then Potiphar's wife uh, kind of betrays him. He ends up in prison, and then from prison, he's finally pulled up out of the pit, and that's what we're reading here in Genesis chapter 41. And he finally gets in front of Pharaoh and interprets Pharaoh's dreams. Genesis 41, starting in verse 39, reads, so Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one as intelligent and wise as you are. You will be over my house, and all my people will obey your commands. Only with regard to the throne will I be greater than you. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, See, I am placing you over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand, put it on Joseph's hand, clothed him in fine linen garments, placed a gold chain around his neck, and had Joseph ride his second uh, his, in his second chariot, and servants called out before him, Abrech. So he placed him over all the land of Egypt. This is really the turning point of Joseph's story. This is when things get worse, worse, worse for him. He's in prison. He's just, it just seems like things are hopeless. Everybody's forgotten about him. And this is the turning point where, where things don't seem quite as bad for Joseph. Not all of his problems are solved. He still doesn't have a relationship with his father or his family. He doesn't know that that if they think he's alive or, or, or dead or what. Um, and this is, this is where the story turns. And J the story of Joseph is all about his, his clothing and his garments. Uh, at, at the very beginning, his father puts on this colorful robe, and then here uh, the, the, the pharaoh puts on this, this new garments for him, uh, a ring, and, and makes him second in command. So Joseph's story is, is all about him uh, kind of becoming, becoming this, this character uh, that that get to to see is he going to choose his his father Israel as his father or is he going to become the the son of Pharaoh um, what what what's he going to do how is he going to act um, and and ultimately he's reunited with his family right and uh, this is kind of the normal way we read this story right and there's nothing wrong with with reading the story this way um, but I want to suggest that there's more interesting and more complicated. Uh, ways to, to think about the story. And uh, to do that, though, first we're going to have to talk about culture. Go to the next slide. So our culture, um, I don't know if you, you guys have, have noticed this, uh, but our culture is struggling to stay together. A lot of tension culture in our society these days. And I think one of the main reasons, and it's not the only reason, 
is, is because two, two worldviews are kind of clashing against one another, and they're a little bit irreconcilable with one another. Okay? The first of these, uh, I'm going to call modernity. Okay? So modernity is, is the, the kind of overarching culture. It started with the Enlightenment back in the 1700s and um, really came to fruition uh, back, back in the 1800s, 1900s. And it's a, it, this, this really high reliance on reason and science, uh, on, on, on thinking. Uh, it's, it's also about truth, uh, for uh, being able to see truth kind of independently of, of, of yourself. Uh, it's this thing that exists outside of yourself. Uh, and and the, the, the ultimate way that these um, things kind of came together is in the kind of free societies, which, which are no longer under a king, uh, and, and they, they kind of coalesce this way. And, and it's, um, that, that was kind of dominant, but the problem was that in the, the, 19, or the 20th century, we had this thing called World War I, and then we had this thing called World War II, and then all the atrocities and horrific things that came after that, right? So the culmination of the Enlightenment and modernity was this horrific tragedy. So it shook everybody's faith and confidence in, in our ability to, to just reason and science our way out of all the world's problems. Uh, all that led us to was maybe the most horrific century we'd seen in uh, recorded history, right? And so that's, that's, that's where we are today, and that led to postmodernism, okay? That's my wacky postmodern uh, little thing up there. So postmodernism, uh, after, after all these tragedies and things, uh, postmodernism says, you know, uh, reason and science, those are, those are just ideologies. They're just, they're just uh, maybe Western ways of thinking. Uh, they compete with, with all sorts of other things, and they're just one way, one way to know things. Um, and the primary way that you should think about history and you should think about the world is through power and who has power and what they're trying to get you to believe. So if, if somebody wants you to believe in science, it's just because that gives them power, right? And so there's... there's, there's um, it's, it's a completely contradictory way of looking at the world as, as modernity, okay? And so there's this culture war going on. So we go to the next slide. Um, so there's, there's this modernity versus post-modernity. And what I want us to, to do today, okay, if, if, if you're a little bit lost, it's okay. We're going to get back into the Bible in just a second. But I want you to, to, to consider that, that the world is calling you to be on one of, one of the sides of this battle, right? Our culture wants you to pick a side and to fight with all you have. And what I want you to do is say that's not a good tactic for the Christian, for the person who's relying on God, is that we cannot be picking sides in these culture wars because we are the children of God and we've come before modernity from this family. We'll be here long after this, this culture passes away and, and we go on to whatever's next. Okay? There's, the reason that these things carry so much weight and they fight against each other is because there's, there's truth on both sides, right? They've, they've warped and twisted things and to a certain extent. Um, neither, though, is, is rooted deeply in the Word of God, in, into the truths of, of, of reality, and that's, that's what we're going to look at today. So first, um, just think about the story we just talked about, Joseph's story. Okay? If, if you want to go down a, a kind of modernist perspective, then you could ask, you know, when exactly in history was there a seven-year worldwide famine? This, this thing that, that Joseph predicted. And to what extent did e Egypt become a regional superpower during this time? And when did Pharaoh end up taking all the land from his people? When, when did all these things happen? You can put it on the timeline in history, you can look at archaeology, you can look at all the documents and everything. That's, that's kind of a modernist perspective on things. A postmodernist would look at that and say, uh, well, what is the motivation for the author of Genesis? What's he trying to prove? What, what, what kind of power is he trying to grab by presenting the story this way? Um, how is he trying to undermine the power of Egypt? And, and it, how is he trying to legitimize Israel as a kingdom and, and delegitimize Egypt? And, and what I want to, again, just, just emphasize, the Bible precedes modernism, right? The Bible was written before these perspectives came about, before these ideologies were, were, were formed. And so what I want us to do is, whenever we approach the Bible, we need to set some of our things aside, set some of our preconceptions the way that we think about things aside so that we can care about what the author, both the human author and, and God as the author of the Bible, we believe that the, the word is inspired by God, so we need to be listening to what they said in their context at that time. We care about science, and we care about history, we care about 
power dynamics and the oppress. The Bible was written with, with a completely different culture, so we ought to approach it as such. All right. So once we have let God's word instruct us, then we can go on to allow uh, to, to revisit some of those questions if we still have those questions in mind. Uh, next slide. But first, I want to look at Judah's story now. Okay? We often don't understand Judah's role in Joseph's story because our culture has a, a real hang-up on, on um, sexuality and, and the role of sex and, and all that, that kind of stuff within, within the Bible and within our own lives. Okay, jo- Judah's story starts back in Genesis 29 uh, with his birth. Go to the next slide. Um, he is uh, the fourth, fourth-born son of Leah, Jacob's unfavored wife. Okay? So he's behind Reuben, Simeon, and Levi. Then it's Judah is the fourth-born son. And in chapter 34, we find out that Simeon and Levi, um, they kind of go off the rails. They, they slaughter a whole village. Uh, it, it, it really upsets Jacob that they go and do this. And so they're kind of put on the, the naughty list. They're, they're not going to be part of um, being the firstborn. Um, so so they, they don't get to be part of that. And then in chapter 35, we, we find out that um, Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel, dies in childbirth. And, and he's got to be really struggling after this happens. Um, and, but then Reuben, uh, he goes and he sleeps with his father's concubine. Okay? So this is very strange to us that why on earth is this stuff happening? Why is it in the Bible? Uh, this makes me uncomfortable. Um, but, but the point, again, is, is that this is a different culture in a different time. And, and for Reuben, this is a power move. This is, he wants to take charge of the family. And so in this culture, in this context, that's what you did if you said, I'm going to be in charge now. But it doesn't work. He doesn't become the head of the family. He actually becomes the third person to enter Jacob's naughty list that is not going to be the firstborn there in, in Israel. Okay? So Jacob now has four sons from his first wife. He has two sons. Um, well, he has a lot of sons. Okay? So, but but there's, there's four sons Judah is, is now kind of up in line for the birthright, but he's not from the favored mother. Okay? So his, his chances of becoming this, this, uh, the one who inherits, uh, who, who is the firstborn, uh, is fairly low. But then Judah comes in and he convinces his brothers to sell Joseph into slavery. Okay? So this, this whole, um, you know, I think we sometimes approach this story as, oh, he just, they're, they're upset with Joseph, and, so they, and they want some money, so they just make this deal. Like, no, Judah has a, has a, has a plan, and he's executing his plan, and he's, he's now gotten rid of Joseph, so who's left? Really just Benjamin, right? Okay, and then we have this whole story about whether Benjamin, how, how is Judah going to treat Benjamin? I want you to do uh, now is just turn to Genesis chapter 38 real quick. And we'll go to the, the next slide. Because okay? uh, there's this really strange story right in the middle of Joseph's, Joseph's whole uh, arc uh, that kind of comes out of nowhere if we don't realize how important Judah is to, this, this, to what's going on here. Um, in, in Genesis 38, Judah moves away from his brothers. He marries a Canaanite woman named Shua, and he has three sons who are named Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Okay, uh, and, and so then uh, in verse 6 it reads, Judah got a wife, Ur, for his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. Now Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the Lord's sight, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, sleep with your brother's wife, perform your duty as her brother-in-law, and produce offspring for your brother. Okay, and then we find out that Onan doesn't do this, and he's also killed by God. So Ur and Onan, both killed by God. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to read the next verses, because it's, 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 it's always strange to me that there's verses uh, of our Bible that, that we probably don't want to be reading in, in, in church, right? Isn't that strange? Um, anyways, so what's going on here? So Judah, in verse 8, is telling his son to do this thing, which is called leveret marriage. Okay, it's an ancient practice. Which, in which you honor the dead, you honor this, this dead man by, um, as, as that dead man's brother, you impregnate his wife in order to give him an heir that can then inherit property so his name isn't erased from the land. Okay? So that you have somebody who's, who's kind of 
uh, treated as this man's son, even though it's actually his brother's son. But that's, that's, it honors him as, as, a, as passing away before he had an heir. Okay? Um, and you can read more about that in Deuteronomy 25. Just, just telling you, it's a thing, it's a thing that happened, but it's, it's strange, uh, but it's very important for the plot line of the story. So check, verse 11 then reads, Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son, Shelah, grows up. For he thought, he might die too, like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. Okay, notice, notice what's happening. Judah puts Tamar, his daughter-in-law, his, his widowed daughter-in-law, back into her father's house. Okay? And when a woman is, is married in ancient time, he becomes part of her husband's house. Okay? So he takes her out of his house and puts her into her, her father's house, back into her father's house. Judah, it seems, we, we kind of get this, this detail here, he thinks that maybe Tamar is, is cursed in some way, that, she, that he, she's the reason her, his sons are dying. We know from, from our, our perspective reading this story that it's his evil sons and their evil behavior that's, that's bringing about their demise. Uh, but, but he is going to keep her out of his house and keep her away from his last son. And the problem here is that nobody's going to marry this widow who's, who's now associated with these two deaths. He's basically taken her off the, the marriageability uh, market and he's, he's kind of forced her back into her father's house as this black sheep who, who married these foreigners. It's just a really bad situation for Tamar. So what I want you, want you to focus on here is that Judah is at a real crossroads in his life. Okay? He's raised two sons. They're both evil. They've been killed by God for their disobedience. And the life of this widowed Canaanite woman, his, his daughter-in-law, is in his hands. And, and before this, he's, he broke his own family apart, his, his father's family, Jacob's family, with the sale of his brother Joseph. And, and, and so when we get this strange story, um, we, we need to pay attention to the details. So after, after this, Tamar dresses up as a prostitute. She tricks her father-in-law into sleeping with her. She becomes pregnant. And then he, she gets evidence from him. And from that evidence, he then makes this statement. He says, she is more righteous than I. And then we go right back into the story of Joseph. What? That, that's such a weird, a weird thing, and it's uh, no wonder that this chapter is never included in, in children's Bibles, right? Just, just a lot of strange stuff. And again, if you're in the modernist camp, then maybe you want to you know, study the, the practices of leveret marriage and whether Tamar should have done this thing and, and whether she was actually in the right or not. Uh, maybe a, a postmodernist would argue that Tamar is, is like an early feminist, and she's fighting this patriarchal system. But now that we've seen this whole story, how it's all connected, we can see how Judah's character is being shaped. And in this case, it's being shaped by this Canaanite woman. She shames him into understanding that he has to protect the people that are put into his care. That the role of the powerful isn't to keep and to hoard what they have and to protect what they have from, from people that might threaten it, but it's to serve the most vulnerable people in their family and in their community. These stories are asking whether we're going to fulfill God's Torah, his instruction, or if we're going to trust in our own, our own uh, protection, our own wealth, our own security. Let's look at the next, next slide now. So we're going to compare yep, this, this slide. Sorry, go back here on the right slide. And Dirk's doing a great job today. He's, he's on it. Um, so we're going to compare. We're going to see exactly how, these, how, how this story is, uh, forces Judah to think about his own actions. Okay? So in Genesis 37, verse 31, it reads, So they took Joseph's robe. So this is Judah and his brothers under Judah's direction. So they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a young goat, dipped the robe in its blood, and then they sent the robe of many colors <clears throat> to their father and said, We found this. Examine it. Is it your son's robe or not? So this is this is them presenting the robe that they that they're lying about their, their brother's death to their father. Then chapter thirty eight verse twenty five reads, as she was being brought out. So this is Tamar. Uh, she's been found out that she's pregnant. Her father in law wants to to have her killed. As she was being brought out, she sent her father in law this message: "I'm pregnant by the man to whom these items belong." And she added, "Examine them. Whose signet ring, cord, and staff are these?" 
So when you see details like these that line up almost exactly, it's like, man, the author is just, just knocking right on your forehead saying, examine these, right? Who's, who's in the right here? And so Judah is, is prompted to remember, examine these. Is, is this your son's robe or not? He, he thinks about this situation, and they overlay on one another. You're supposed to think about these stories in parallel. Is Judah going to sell off this person that's in his care? Is he going to, is he going to have her killed? Or is he going to rescue her this time? And he does. And so this moment is initiated by this woman, Tamar, and it completely changes the trajectory of Judah's life. And just like we saw last week, um, this, this, this female character, this, this woman, is, is kind of framing, shaping, and inviting Judah into God's story, which is just incredible. He, in, he invites him into this repentance and to reconsider his family and how he ought to act in this situation. So Judah then actually steps up into the role of the firstborn. Reuben, um, so, so they, they, they go down to Egypt because of the famine, and then they come back, and um, they, they need to go back down again, but they can't go back down to, to, go, to, Far- to go to Pharaoh's second-in-command, who is Joseph, without their brother Benjamin. He says he wants to see their other brother. Reuben fails to convince Jacob to give him Benjamin for the return trip to Egypt. That happens in chapter 42. But then Judah tells Jacob that he's going to put his own life on the line for his half-brother, Benjamin. And so when he gets to Egypt with Benjamin, this is actually put to the test. And Judah performs admirably. He shows Joseph that he's willing to give his own life now for his half-brother, Benjamin. Instead of selling away this brother, instead of getting rid of him and, and going back and becoming the, the heir, he, he has had a complete change of character, change of heart, uh, and, and become this new person. So you go on forward. So Judah's, Judah's arc now kind of encompasses Joseph's. And it doesn't mean that Joseph's story is any less important, but it, but it means that if you know, we look through these other modernist or postmodernist lens, that, then we're likely to be confused about why this random story about Tamar comes up, and why Reuben is failing to act like the firstborn, but Judah succeeds um, and, and gains his father's blessing. Okay? So, so all, all I'm trying to do is... is the Bible was written in a certain context, and if we set aside some of these other things, then we can get closer to the story. We can have it the story in a way that's going to help us understand exactly what's going on and how we ought to act. Okay. Let's go to the next slide now. So one of the, one of the main problems with the modernist and, and postmodernist perspectives is that they're often enamored with, with the really small details, really, really looking in close at a, at a text or close at... At archaeology, they, they really want to get the science and the, the actuality. And um, that's, that's the culture that we swim in. That's, that's how we, we kind of inhabit the world. And so one of the really greatest blessings for me in my life has been learning to read the Bible with a perspective on the bigger story, on stepping away from the minute, minute details, the individual verse, and trying to read with a bigger perspective, trying to look at this character. How does he change and grow? Or how does she, how does she affect and frame? How, how, how do these characters change over time, uh, and, and how are they, they pursuing God, failing, picking themselves up, repenting, and, and continuing to pursue God. And so um, that's, that's what I'm urging today, is, is that we have to, we, we, we have to, we don't have to, but, but I think the Bible invites us to read it in, the, in this way. The, the, the authors have left these breadcrumbs and these details to, to ask you to say, hey, let's, let's, Dig into this story more. Let's read it every day. Let's think about it every day. Um, instead of uh, maybe the, the way that, that, at least the way that I used to read the Bible, which was, which was much, much less thoughtfully. Now let's turn uh, to Genesis chapter 28. I want, I want us to look uh, at, at an example of, of this kind of thing happening. So this is the last, last story that we're going to look at today, it's, and it's Jacob's story. So his, his story begins all the way back in Genesis chapter 25 and 27. You know, we read about him stealing the birthright, and he steals the blessing from his brother. And in Genesis chapter 28, he's, he's heading off into, into the, the land of Haran, uh, and on the way, we find out that he's going he's, he's gonna to make a bargain with God at Bethel. So 28 verse 20 reads, Then Jacob made a vow, If God will be with me and watch over me on this journey, if he provides me with food to eat and clothing to wear, and if I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. 
This stone that I've set up as a marker will be God's house, and I'll give you a tenth of all that you give me. Okay? So, so very, very conditional here. Very, very conditional agreement here. And now turn with me to Genesis chapter 35. So, so Jacob goes through his, his, whole, his whole life. He goes through his whole arc. He goes to Haran. He gets uh, four wives, it turns out. He gets 12 children. He gets all the abundance. He gets all these things uh, that we talked about last week. Uh, and, and then he comes back to the land. And uh, he, he starts having trouble with all of his neighbors, and he starts having all these problems with his family and all his possessions. Uh, but then he kind of decides to make good on this promise that he's, he's made to God. So Genesis 35, verse 4, uh, we, we read about him coming back to Bethel now. Then Jacob gave, <clears throat> excuse me, then they gave Jacob all their foreign gods and their earrings. So there's all the people that are with, with Jacob, he tells them to give them, give them all the idols and, and all the stuff that they've been carrying around, kind of reminding them of their idolatrous past. But then they gave Jacob all their foreign gods and their earrings, and Jacob hid them under the oak near Shechem. When they set out, a terror from God came over all the cities around them, and they did not pursue Jacob's sons. So Jacob and all who were with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. Jacob built an altar there, called the place God of Bethel, because it was there that God had revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. So this kind of seems like a turning point in Jacob's life, but notice that, one, he doesn't actually destroy the idols. He hides them under a tree. Right? You hide things under a tree if you want to know where they are so you can come back just, you know, just in case. Right? He hides them under a tree, and, and he doesn't actually mention this oath. Remember that oath? Or he said he was going to give a tenth of everything that God had given him. He's going to give that back to God. Nowhere to be seen. Seen? And then the very next story, Jacob loses one of his twelve sons. Now, do we know a story about someone giving up one of their sons to God? Yeah, this is where we all started with this story, right? Abraham and, and Isaac. And so the Joseph story then turns and repeat is, is kind of a repeat of Abraham's story. And once he loses that first son, then we, we wonder, is Jacob going to voluntarily give up his son Benjamin and trust in God's goodness and his provision, trust his son Judah, who he doesn't know this, but his, his son Judah has already given up this other son uh, into captivity. So is, is Jacob going to give this tithe? Is he going to give this offering back to God? Or is he going to, uh, to bring death and destruction by not doing it? And he does. You know, it's incredible. He, he, he entrusts his son and his family is, is reunited in this way. Uh, it's, it's, it's very incredible. And so the last, last thing for today is, is just, I want us to consider our, our story. Okay? And, and you know, the last five chapters of Genesis, they really, so you see how all the arrows are kind of converging down in the, into one spot here. So, so we, we kind of, we tend to skip over the last five chapters in Genesis um, because we struggle to see why they're why why do they bring Jacob back into the story? Um, why why do they they come with a whole chapter of, of blessings and, and um, but but again if we step away from our own context and we see these as they're written, you can see that that all these stories are beautifully woven together to end up in these these last five chapters of Genesis. It's going to wrap up all those all those things that we've been wondering if if we've been carefully reading the text. And it's going to prepare the reader for Exodus and the rest of the Bible as we, as we come through. And so my question for, for all of us today is, are, are we living out these stories? Can, can we put ourselves into the shoes of Joseph? Somebody who is, who is young and proud and arrogant and inconsiderate of, of his brothers or inconsiderate of others. Or maybe we can put ourselves into Judah. Are we acting vengefully and selfishly towards our friends and our brothers and sisters? Are we Jacob? Are we tricking? Are we, are we trying to, to put some insurance under, under the tree? Are we trying to pull a fast one on God in our lives? Well, the, the good news is that, uh, that, that Jesus tells us that he's the one who actually fulfills the Torah. Right? So this means that, that Jesus is the son of Israel. So he's the son of Jacob. He's the one who, who trusts God's story completely 
And he's the one who brings the blessings to all the world because he lives life as God intended. And the good news about Jesus isn't just that he did that, but that he's inviting us to be like him. He's inviting us to become like him, right? And so we can bring this blessing into the world in, in those ways, in, in how, we, how we act and, and imitate him. And so Jesus is also the son of Judah, right? He's from the tribe of Judah. He sacrifices himself for his younger brother. And that's, that's really, that, that's how we are depicted when we're baptized. We become Jesus' younger brother or sister, right? We're adopted into a family of God as, as Jesus' younger brother and sister. And so as children of God, we are to learn throughout our lives that we're to be more like sons and daughters of the king. And the king is legitimate because he sacrifices himself for his friends. And then lastly, Jesus is the son of Joseph. Right? Jesus is the one who descends into the pit and then comes out of that pit and rescues the whole world. Ephesians 4 talks about that a great deal. And so right now, I, I, I don't know where you are. And, and so this is, this is the invitation. So um, I, I, put the, I put the little arrows with little dots up there because I want us to consider where, where, where am I in, in this story? Am, am I on the, more on the left side of this, this, this line where I'm encountering all these problems, all these challenges, all these difficulties? Am I in rebellion against God's story and his plans for my life and, and my role in this, in this body of believers? Or am I, am I at that turning point? Am I, am I somewhere where I can uh, give it away to God, where I can stop resisting, stop fighting, and trust in his, his good story, trust in, in his family, trust with one another so that we can accomplish what he wants for us to do? Um, or maybe, maybe you know, you're, you're just on the, on the, the maybe the, you, you've done all that stuff, but, but life is just tough. You're just going through a lot of stuff still. And, and, you know, whatever those needs are, um, that's, that's what this invitation is for. Okay? We want to pray for you. We want to provide as, as that family um, and, and bring you, bring you uh, closer to us. So whatever your needs are, um, please make those known as we stand and as we sing.